All right. I haven't checked it this morning, but Friday it was just Rainier, Isabella Hamlin, Hannah Horton, and Haley Summers that still needed to finish your read works. If you already finished it since then, that's fine. I just haven't checked yet this morning. I didn't have time. Um, so need to finish your read works. If you did finish your read works, everyone else, besides the four names I just said, I've already put in your nonfiction um, grade into power schools. So that's in there. Um, and I'm going to tell you, some of you guys um, might have hurt your grade a little bit because even with that extra read work, some of your guys' read works grades were not as good as they should have been. Okay. Like there's no reason our read works grade shouldn't be B or an A. So I'm just letting you know, not the coolest, but um, if you didn't finish yours yet, you need to get it done by the end of the day today. Once again, Rainier, Isabella, Hannah, Horton, and Haley Summers. If you already finished it, that's fine. I just haven't checked this morning. Okay. I hope everyone's having a fabulous day. Um, today's our, or today starts our last full week of school, which is exciting. Last full week. Okay, so let me get a little stuff my hot chocolate, and then we're going to get started. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't drink coffee. Okay. You're welcome, Michaela. You did fabulous. Okay. Anyways, so Friday where we left off, it was like, oh, snap, right? Like we had some, oh, snap moments. I loved them. Like, man, I could just be reading this book all day. Like, but we can't read it all day. So remember, we found her mom, found Phoebe's mom. She kissed, was kissing a lunatic on the cheek. And I remember all of you guys were like, oh my God. But then Mr. Evan Robinson pointed out, like, did any of you ever think it could be a friendly kiss? Like, we don't know what type of kiss it was. Like, it was just their cheek. Um, uh, then, um, remember, Sal just rolled out, left her friend. And I talked about how you shouldn't leave your friend in weird places, especially a college campus. But anyway, Sal rolled out. She ended up at the hospital. And um, she saw Ben and Ben's mom. And remember, we found out Ben's mom was on um, a psychiatric ward. So she has some type of mental um, disability or something is wrong where she can't take care of herself. And she's like a danger to herself, which is why she's there. So and then Sal and Ben finally kissed. Finally happened after like 560 tries. So go them, I guess, you know. Woo. So we are on 38 splits, okay? I'm so pumped to read this with you guys. Everyone focus okay okay at this point in my story graham interrupted oh yes 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 she said i've been waiting for that kiss for days i do like a story with good kissing in it <laughs> she's such a gooseberry graham said we were churning through montana i didn't dare check our progress on the map i didn't want to discover that we couldn't make it in time i thought that if i kept talking and praying underneath that if we kept moving along those mountain roads, we had a chance. Graham said, but what about Peavy? What about her mother kissing the lunatic? I didn't like that kiss very much. It was the other kiss I liked, the one with Ben. So go Miss Sal. Like, she just told her grandparents, you know, that she kissed Ben. Oh, so nice. And her grandma, like, is so happy. Well, she's like a, you know, she's like preteen, like teenager, right? She's 13, so I guess it's okay. I found Phoebe at the bus station sitting on the bench. Where were you, she asked. I did not tell her about seeing Ben and his mother. I wanted to, but I couldn't. I was afraid, Phoebe. I couldn't stay there. And I thought you were the brave one. 240, Evan. She said, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. I'm sick of it. What happened? Nothing. They sat on the bench having a gay old time. If I could toss rocks like you toss rocks, I'd have plunked them both in the back of the head. Did you notice her hair? She's cut it. It's short. And do you know what else she did? In the middle of talking, she leaned over and spit on the grass. Spit! It was disgusting. And the lunatic? Do you know what he did when she spit? He laughed. And then he leaned over and he spit. Why would they do that? Who knows? I'm sick of it. My mother can stay there for all I care. She doesn't need me. She doesn't need any of us. Now, here's a chance. To, like here's a moment to think like this speedy probably really mean that her mother can stay there forever probably not but she's just really upset in this moment and sometimes when you're upset you say things you don't mean like oh but like who cares if i never see her again but really deep down she probably does care but that's just mrs kneifel's opinion and you know like obviously we can assume by what we know about phoebe she does not spit okay she's miss proper and she saw her mother spitting and she's just like oh my god why would she do that you know as if that's that big of a deal but it's fine 
Phoebe was like that all the way home on the bus. She was in an extensively back black mood. We got to Phoebe's house just as her father pulled in the driveway. Prudence rushed out of the house saying, she called, she called, she called, mom called, she's coming home. Terrific, Phoebe muttered. What was that, Phoebe? Her father said, nothing. She's coming home tomorrow, Prudence said, but what's wrong? Her father said, what else did she say? She sounded nervous. She wanted to talk with you. Did she leave a number? I'll call her back. No, she didn't leave any number. She said to tell you not to make any prejudgments. What is that supposed to mean? Her father said, not to make any prejudgments about what? I don't know, Prudence said. And oh, most, most important, she said that she's bringing someone with her. That's just grand, Phoebe said, just grand. Phoebe, her father said, Prudence, did she say who she's bringing? I honestly cannot say. Did she refer to this person at all? Did she mention a name? He was getting agitated. Why no, Prudence said, she didn't mention a name. She just said that she was bringing him with her. Him? Phoebe looked at me. Cripes, she said. And she went into the house, slamming the door behind her. Oh, snap. So sometime between Phoebe getting on the bus and coming home, Phoebe's mom rang, you know, Mrs. Winterbottom called up. Prudence was the only one home and she's coming home. She's coming home tomorrow and she's bringing someone with her. And it coincidentally was a him according to Prudence. So we're going to assume it was whoever was at the, where was it? Whoever was at the university with her. Dun, 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 dun. I can't believe it. Wasn't she going to tell her father what she had seen? I was bursting at the seams to tell my own father. But when I got home, he and Margaret were sitting on the porch. Margaret said, my brother told me you're in his English class. What a surprise. She must have already told my father this because he didn't look too surprised. He's a terrific teacher. Do you like him? I suppose. I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted Margaret to vanish. I had to wait until she went home to tell my father about Phoebe's mother. And when I did tell him, all he said was, so Mrs. Winterbottom is coming home. That's good. Then he went over to the window and stared out for the longest time, and I knew he was thinking about my mother. So remember, Phoebe and Sal were kind of in a similar situation because Phoebe's or Sal's mom left, and Sal's mom was supposed to come home, but we know she never came home, where Phoebe's mom is coming home. So Sal, once Sal told her dad, hey, Phoebe's mom's coming home, you know, all he could focus on was, oh, like, she gets to come home, you know, where his wife didn't get to come home. So that's probably bringing back some, like, feelings for him. All that night, I thought about Phoebe and Prudence and Mr. Winterbottom. It seems like their whole world was going to fall apart the next day when Mrs. Winterbottom walked in all cuddly with the lunatic. 39. Homecoming. The next morning, Phoebe phoned, begging me to come over. I can't stand it, she said. I want a witness. For what? I just want a witness. Did you tell your father about your mother and are you kidding me phoebe said you should see him he and prudence spent all last night and this morning cleaning the house they scrubbed floors and bathrooms they dusted like fiends they did laundry and ironing they vacuumed then they took a good look around my father said maybe it looks too good your mother will think we can function without her so they messed things up he's very put out with me that i wouldn't help that means like he's mad at her like what the heck phoebe like why aren't you helping get ready for your mother I did not want to be a witness to anything, but I felt guilty for running away the day before. And so I agreed. When I got to her house, Phoebe, Mr. Winterbottom, and Prudence were sitting there staring at each other. Didn't she say what time he was coming? What time she was coming, Mr. Winterbottom asked? Prudence said, no, she did not. And I wish she would quit acting like it's my fault that she did not say more than she did. Mr. Winterbottom was erect. He jumped up to straighten the pillow and sat back down. And then he leaped up to mess up the pillow again. He went out into the yard and walked around in circles. He changed his shirt twice. Like, remember, this is his wife. Like, they've been together for a really long time. I mean, Prudence is a, Prudence is a teenager, but he's so nervous about her coming home because he doesn't know why she left. Like, he's a train wreck. He's, like, literally walking in circles, changing his clothes, like. You know, mess. Sorry, I was looking at an email. I hope you don't mind that I'm here, I said. Why would I mind, Mr. Winterbottom said. Just as I thought. They were all going to go stark, raving mad. A taxi pulled up outside. I can't look, Mr. Winterbottom said, escaping to the kitchen. I can't look either, Phoebe said. She followed her father, and I followed Phoebe. Well, gosh, Prudence said. I don't know what has gotten into everybody. Aren't you excited to see her? From the kitchen, we heard Prudence open the front door. 
We heard Mrs. Winterbottom say, oh, sweetie, and Mr. Winterbottom wiped the kitchen counter. We heard Prudence gasp and her mother say, I'd like you to meet Mike. Mike, Mr. Winterbottom said. He was quite red in the face. I was glad there was no ax in the house or I'm fairly certain he would have picked it up and headed straight for Mike. Phoebe said, now, Dad, don't do anything too rash. Mike, he repeated. Mrs. Winter called, Mrs. Winterbottom called, George, Phoebe. We heard her say to Prudence, where are they? Didn't you tell them we were coming? Mr. Winterbottom took a deep breath. Phoebe, I'm not sure you or Sal should be around for this. Are you kidding, Phoebe said. He took another deep breath. Okay, he said, okay, here we go. He stood up straight and tall and walked through the living room. Phoebe and I followed. Olivia, do you have a question or is your hand just up? What page are we on? 245. Honestly and truly, I think Phoebe nearly fainted dead away on the carpet. There were two reasons for this. The first was that Mrs. Winterbottom looked different. Her hair was not only short, but it was also quite stylish. She was wearing lipstick and mascara and a little brush on her blush on her cheeks and her clothes were all together unlike anything I had ever seen her in. A white t-shirt, blue jeans and flat black shoes. Dangling from her ears were thin silver hoop earrings. She looked magnificent but she did not look like Phoebe's mother. Remember, Phoebe's mother said like in the past, like very beginning of the book that she lived like a plain life. Like she literally just looked like a mom, like a mom, straight mom look. And now she has stylish haircut. She has makeup on, she has beautiful earrings. Like she just looks more like in style, okay? She just doesn't look like how Phoebe and Sal remember her, which is okay. Sometimes people need to change their look. Mrs. Kneifels looked the same for years and years and years. Maybe someday I'll change my look. Probably not, but, um, you know, some people do. The second reason I think Phoebe nearly fainted dead away was that there was Mike Bickle, Phoebe's potential lunatic, in her own living room. It was the one thing to think he was coming and another to actually see him standing there. I didn't know what to think. For a second, I thought maybe Mike had kidnapped Mr. Winterbottom and was bringing her back for some ransom money, or maybe he was now going to do away with the West of us. But I kept thinking of seeing them together the day before. And besides, Mrs. Winterbottom looked too terrific to have been held captive. She did look frightened, but not of Mike. She seemed afraid of her husband. Dad, Phoebe whispered, that's the lunatic. Oh, Phoebe, her mother said, pressing her fingers to her cheek. And when she made a familiar gesture, Phoebe looked as if her heart was splitting into a thousand pieces. Mrs. Winterbottom hugged Phoebe, but Phoebe did not hug her back. Mr. Winterbottom said, Norma, I hope you're going to explain what exactly is going on here. He was trying to make his voice firm, but it trembled. Prudence stared at Mike. She seemed to find him handsome and was flirting with him. She fluffed her hair away from her neck. Like, okay. She's flirting with a lunatic, like being all girly. Like, Prudence is like MIA. Like, she's in her own world. There's no idea that it's weird that her mother's bringing home this boy slash young man. Mrs. Winterbottom tried to put her arms around Mr. Winterbottom, but he pulled away. I think we deserve an explanation, he said. He, too, stared at Mike. Was she in love with Mike? He seemed awfully, awfully young, not much older than Prudence. Mrs. Winterbottom sat down on the sofa and began to cry. It was a terrible, terrible moment. It was hard to make sense out of any of what she said at first. She was talking about being respectable and how Mr. Winterbottom would never forgive her, but she was tired of being so respectable. She had tried very, very hard all these years to be perfect, but she had to admit she was quite unperfect. She said there was something that she had never told her husband and she feared he would not forgive her for it. Mr. Winterbottom's hands trembled. He did not say anything. Mrs. Winterbottom motioned for Mike to join her on the sofa. Mrs. Win Mr. Winterbottom cleared his throat several times, but still he said nothing. So Mrs. Winterbottom's like having hot mess, like crying. I don't know if you've ever listened to someone cry while they're trying to explain something and like nothing makes sense because they're crying, they're explaining. Like, so she's just saying all these things and everyone's just like, everyone's just basically staring at her like, uh, okay. Mr. Winterbottom said, Mrs. Winterbottom said, Mike is my son. Mrs. Mr. Winterbottom, Pr Prudence, Phoebe, and I all said, your son? So the lunatic is her son. So that means when she kissed her on the cheek yesterday, it was like a friendly kiss, like a parent thing, you know? Mr. Winterbottom stared at her husband. George, I know you will think I am not 
or was not respectable, but it was before I met you and I had to give him up for adoption and I could hardly bear to think of it. And Mr. Winterbottom said, respectable, respectable. What the H E L L with respectable. Mr. Winterbottom did not normally swear. Mrs. Winterbottom stood up. Mike found me. And at first I was frightened of what that would mean. I've lived such a tiny life. Phoebe took her father's hand. And if I have to go away and sort things out, I haven't met Mike's adopted parents, but Mike said I'd spent a lot of time talking and I've been thinking. Mike looked down at his feet. Are you going to leave? Mr. Winterbottom asked. Mrs. Winterbottom looked as if he had, Mrs. Winterbottom looked as if he had slapped her. Leave? Again, I mean, Mr. Winterbottom said. Only if you want me to, she said. Only if you cannot live with such an unrespectable I said to H-E-L-L with respectable, Mr. Winterbottom said. What's all this about respectable? It's not respectable. I'm concerned about. I'm more concerned that you couldn't or wouldn't tell me about any of this. Mike stood up. I knew it wouldn't work, he said. Mr. Winterbottom said, I have nothing against you, Mike. I just don't know you. He looked at his wife. And I don't know you either. I was wishing I was invisible. Outside, the leaves were falling to the ground, and I was infinitely sad, sad down to my bones. I was sad for Phoebe and her parents and Prudence and Mike, sad for the leaves that were dying, and sad for myself for something I had lost. I saw Mrs. Partridge through the window, standing on Phoebe's front walk. Mr. Winterbottom said, I think we all need some time to sit down and talk. Maybe we can sort something out. Then he did what I think was a noble thing. He went over to Mike and shook his hand and said, I did always think a son would be a nice addition to this family. Oh, so nice. So a long time ago, before Mrs. Winterbottom had ever met Mr. Winterbottom, she had had a child that she put him up for adoption. So she was probably really young. That happens a lot. But anyway, she had given him up for adoption and had never found him. Like that, that was just a different part of her life. And, you know, she tried her best to be the perfect mom for Prudence and Phoebe and the perfect wife. And then Mike found her remember the first time he came to the winter bottoms residence there are definitely programs out there that can help you find like your adoptive parent or if you gave a child away or whatever so all this craziness is happening but mr winter bottoms already like shook his hand and it was already like oh always wanted a son that's nice mrs Winterbottom looked relieved prudent smiled at mike phoebe stood motionless off to the side i better go i said everyone turned to me as if i just popped through the roof mr winter bottom said sal I'm sorry. I truly am. To Mike, he said, Sal, it is like an Sal is like another member of the family. Mrs. Winterbottom said, you're not mad at me. Aren't, you're mad at me, aren't you, Phoebe? Yes, Phoebe said, I most certainly am. Phoebe took my sleeve and pulled me towards the door. When you all decide exactly how many people are in this family, let me know. We stepped out on the porch just as Mrs. Partridge placed a white envelope on the steps. Okay, so everyone, let's take five seconds to talk. All right, so Phoebe's still really upset. Obviously, I mean, Phoebe's only like 13-ish. She just found out her mother has another kid. Like, that's kind of an adjusting period. So she's just mad. She's confused on why her mom left. She's confused on why she doesn't know any of this. So she just rolled out and was like, yeah, when you figure out how many people are in the family, you know, just let me know. So she's just frustrated, which is obviously... Like, I can see why she might be frustrated, okay? And then Mrs. Partridge, who Mrs. Cadaver's mom, just dropped a white envelope on the porch, which means who's been leaving all the notes? Not the lunatic, Mrs. Partridge. Why has Mrs. Partridge been leaving notes, you wonder? I don't know. So we're going to find out. She's crazy. She's the one that's blind, remember, Mrs. Partridge? So anyways, we're about to find out. Let me take a drink. We probably have time for one more chapter, and then, um, yeah. Well, hey, we're about to read it. The Gifts, Chapter 40, 251. It seemed fitting that at this point in my story of Phoebe, Gramps yelled out, ID ho! We were high in the mountains and had just crossed the Montana border into Idaho. For the first time, I believed we were going to make it to Lewiston by the next day, the 20th of August, my mother's birthday. Graham suggested we press on to Cordelian, Le I can not, Cordelian, I think is how you say it, I'm not totally sure, about an hour away where we could spend the night. From there, Lewinston was about 100 miles due south, an easy morning journey. How does that sound to you, Gooseberry? Graham was still 
her head pressed against the back of the seat and her hands folded in her lap. Gooseberry. When Graham spoke, you could hear the rattle in her chest. Oh, that's fine, she said. Gooseberry, are you feeling okay? I'm a little tired, she said. We'll get you to bed real soon. Gramps blacked at me. Gramps glanced back at me, troubled. Graham, if you want to stop now, that would be okay, I said. Oh, no, she said. I'd like to sleep in Cordeline tonight. Your mama sent us a postcard from Cordeline, and on it was a beautiful blue lake. She coughed a long, rattly cough. Gramps said, okay, then. Bound beautiful blue lake. Here we come. Graham said, I'm so glad Peavy's mama came home. I wish your mama could come home too. Gramps nodded his head for about five minutes. Then he handed me a tissue and said, Tell us about Mrs. Partridge. What was she doing leaving a gall dang envelope on Peavy's porch? That's what Phoebe and I wanted to know. Did you want something, Mrs. Partridge, I asked? She put her hands on her lip. Hmm, she said. Phoebe snatched the envelope and ripped it open. She read the message aloud. Don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. Mrs. Partridge turned around. Bye-bye, she said. Mrs. Partridge, Phoebe said. We've already had this one. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Partridge said. It was you, wasn't it, Phoebe said. You've been creeping around, leaving these things, haven't you? Did you like them, Mrs. Partridge said, as she stood here in the middle of the sidewalk with her head tilted up at us. With a quizzical look on her face, she looked like a mischievous child. Margaret reads them for me from the paper each day. And when there's a nice one, I ask her to copy it down. I'm sorry I gave you that one about the moccasins already. My noggin forgot. But why did you bring them here, Phoebe said. I thought you would be great. I thought it would be a grandiful surprise for you, like fortune cookies. Only I didn't have any cookies to put them in. Did you like them anyways? Like, okay, old lady, Mrs. Partridge, she heard these nice sayings, has her daughter write them down, and she just, oh, you know what, the next door neighbors might like those, here's your fortune cookie without the cookie, and she leaves it, like, so all these notes that have caused Phoebe so much panic is literally just an old lady giving her a nice saying, that's it, and, but, you know, why would they, why would they suspect Mrs. Partridge, like, that's so silly, <clears throat> Phoebe looked at me for a long minute. Then she went down the steps and said, Mrs. Partridge, when was it you met my brother? You said he didn't have a brother, Mrs. Partridge said. I know, but you said he met him. When was that? She tapped on her head. Noggin, remember, let's see, about, let's see, some time ago, a week, two weeks. He came to my house by mistake. He let me feel his face. That's why I thought he was your brother. He had a similar face. Isn't that peculiar, Bert? Kip, kip, Peculiables. Peculiable? However you say that word. Don't mind me. Phoebe said, not more peculiable than most things lately. As Mrs. Partridge toddled back to her house, Phoebe said, it's a peculiar world, Sal. She walked across the grass and spit into the street. She said, come on, try it. I spit into the street. What do you think, Phoebe said. We spit again. It might sound disgusting, but to tell the truth, we did a great, we got a great deal of pleasure from those spits. I doubt if I ever could explain why that was, but for some reason, it seemed the perfect thing to do. And when Phoebe turned around and we went into the house, I knew that was the right thing for her to do too. With the courage of that spit in me, I went to see Margaret to cadaver and we had a long talk. And that's when I found out how she met my father. It was painful to talk to her and I even cried in front of her. But afterwards, I understood why my father liked to be with her. Oh, Sam. So she's finally talking to Margaret. Remember, Sally doesn't like Margaret because Margaret hangs out with her father and she feels like, you know, her father only needs to be hanging out with her mother. Like she doesn't ever want to talk to Margaret or slash Mrs. Cadaver, but apparently they just had a nice long talk. Ben was sitting on my front steps when I got home. He said, I brought you something. It's out back. He led me around the side of the house and there strutting across the little patch of grass was a chicken. I had never in my life, I was never in my life so happy to see a chicken. Ben said, I named it, but you can change the name if you want. When I asked him what the name was, he leaned forward, he leaned forward and I leaned forward and another kiss happened, a spectacular kiss, a perfect kiss. And Ben said, its name is Blackberry. Aww. So cute.
So Ben, remember, Sal lost her chickens, lost her farm. She's in, you know, Euclid, Ohio. She doesn't have all the things she wants. And Ben found her a chicken and named it Blackberry. How sweet of Ben. Like, what a great gift. I mean, Mrs. Kneifel doesn't want a chicken, but, you know, Sal clearly does. Oh, Graham said, is that the end of the PD story? Yes, I said. That wasn't quite true, I suppose. As I could have told more, I could have told about Phoebe getting adjusted to having a brother and to her new mother and all of that. But part, but that part was still going on. Even as we traveled through the mountains, it was a whole different story. I like the story about PD, and I'm glad it wasn't too awfully sad. Grams closed her eyes, and for the next hour, as Grams drove towards Cordeline, he and I listened to her rattly breathing. I watched her lying there so still, so calm. Gramps, I whispered. She looks a little gray, doesn't she? Yes, she does, Chickabitty. Yes, she does. He stepped on the gas, and we raced towards Cordeline. All right, we are just about out of time. We are going to stop there. Remember, we're having um, Reading RTI twice today. So I will see you guys at 11.15, and we might be able to finish the book. Peace out. See you guys in a little bit. Don't forget to finish your read works if you have to still.